Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um, and a very warm welcome to everybody. Welcome back from, from your lunch. I hope you're not feeling too, too sleepy. Uh, we have a very esteemed um, uh, panelist uh, to discuss um, with us this afternoon. Um, and I'm just quickly going to uh, highlight the uh, format. Um, I'm going to um, uh, introduce um, our three panelists and ask them to give a quick overview of their issues and challenges from their respective institutions regarding fintech uh, and not necessarily Islamic banking, but, but perhaps banking uh, in, in, in total. Um, and then, we'll, then I'll ask them a few uh, uh, questions and answers and perhaps we'll open up, inshallah we'll have some time to open up to the floor afterwards. So I think without much further ado, I'm going to start uh, ladies first, uh, Yang Mulia. Um, perhaps I can uh, invite you for, for your quick overview. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum. Um, these must be the really hardcore group that, that actually came back after lunch. I, I saw a couple of people who never came back, um, uh, Dr. Adam. So we hope to make this. Um, I hope we. I, I'll take their attendance. Yeah, take take attendance and uh, let's make it interactive. Um, the 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 topic of fintech. I I'd like to just start with the whole digitization of the banking industry. And uh, my good friend is sitting right in front there, just listening to me saying this time and again. Um, the disruption within the banking industry is not quite felt by practitioners, unfortunately. Um, in Malaysia, most bankers feel that the disruption is just, you know, um, bits and pieces that, that, that would not really affect their business. So there's no real major drive to do things differently today. So every bank in Malaysia has done bits and, people, bits and pieces of digitization, but not really pushing the boundaries, not in this country. And largely because a lot of practitioners feel that, then, that we are protected by regulation and that this is our divine um, right to do banking business. But the reality is, those fintechs that you talk about and the whole disruption will not come in the form of a huge entity, a huge digital entity that will then envelop or take over the current traditional banks. What you will see is bits and pieces of our businesses that will be chipped off. Unfortunately, it will be the more profitable businesses that will be chipped off. Those fintechs have no interest to take on the least profitable side of our business. Today, the least profitable business of a bank is the lending business, the financing business. That is the most expensive part of our business because it requires capital. And because of the new capital regime, Basel III, new liquidity ratios, it becomes extremely expensive to run this business. But what they are interested in are the businesses which doesn't require capital, largely in the payment space, FX, things that don't require capital. And those are the businesses that we're going to lose. And, the, and we're going to end up, we'll be left with the expensive side of the business. And we used to think of fintech as the small guys, the small guys are going to come and eat our business. But the thing is, right now, the biggest disruptors to us are not really the small guys. We're talking about the Google, the likes of the Google, the, the, the Alibaba as well, in addition to the small guys. So they can make a huge change. Hold the entire payment conversation. Wallets will one day take over this whole savings account as you know it today. The whole concept of CASA to the millennials will be very different than what you and I are used to. We put our money in a bank. The millennials are quite happy to put their money in store value cards. And this is the reality. So for a lot of banks, we try to change from within. And we don't know, to be honest today, we really don't know what model is going to work. So all of us have got, every bank I know has a digital team, has got a digital division, as to whether we would be successful in actually digitizing our business remains to be seen. Why? Because we are saddled with huge legacy systems expensive legacy systems with framework, risk and compliance framework that 
is laborious, which a lot of us who've been in the business for more than 20 years are simply unable to think out of the box. So if you talk about credit, this is how we do credit. But the fintech guys do it very differently. So if I just, if I just may share with you, uh, there is this group of people in the US called Cabbage. They do micro SME funding but using algorithm platforms. They don't have a credit committee that actually goes through all the papers. They feed data which is picked up from um, essentially feeding in big data. A lot of their data is picked up from PayPal. And so they feed into this algorithm platform, and then they churn it out and decide how much you are worth, uh, how much they can actually lend you, and how much you're able to pay back. It is very different than how traditional banks operate today. So I think that, to me, is our biggest challenge. Our ability to re-engineer ourselves, to really be able to prepare and, and embrace disruption. Do you think, Amelia, the, the fintech guys within, within banks at the moment, should they be given more independence? Should they be given you know, uh, f freedom to set up potentially a, a virtual bank? Or is it still constrained at the moment? Um, well, we have this sandbox thing that says that you could try to do stuff there. But we have not quite seen like the UK allowing people to open a 100% digital bank. Um, for as long as um, the regulations have not quite allowed the next guy to just do that, you won't quite see you know, uh, that, that kind of change. Because if you take a fintech company and, and, and if a bank acquires a fintech company, and I can tell you that fintech company will change into, it will fall into the whole old behavior of uh, and DNA of the bank. So is that, that's not going to work. But yeah, may, but from, from reading between the lines of what the governor is saying, I think he's preparing us towards that journey. He's actually warning the banks. He said, your lunch, somebody's going to eat your lunch, so you guys better buck up and change, or you're going to disappear. Get ready, or else. <laughs> uh, that's ready. Uh, perhaps we can share a few uh, insights or overview from RHB's perspective. All right. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, glad to be here, Dr. Adam. Okay, basically, uh, I think the topic is about fintech and the impact on banks. Technology is nothing new to banks. I think some of us are all bankers here. Okay, I think even before the buzzword of fintech and all that, there has been a lot of things that we have been uh, adopting. We have been employing, though it may be homegrown, as in the bank themselves have that product, create that thing, or basically banks have been partnering with a lot of people. Uh, so this is a close partner of RHB. Uh, I would say that maybe after this, he can, he can sort of give the instance whereby the company, Sedania, comes with something which is actually long before the fintech buzz was, was around. And yes, this is something about B2B, business to business that we have been working with. And basically, these are invisible, invisible to the customers. So I, I would say that, first of all, FinTech is nothing, is nothing new. Okay? We, we have been using that. Secondly, I think one of the uh, early adopters of technology is bank, so there, thereby, when it comes to FinTech, all these disruptive, uh, disruptive technologies, then we, are, we should be at the forefront as well to embrace this. Okay, uh, if I can give an instance, I think a lot of us were around in late 80s or early 90s at the advent of internet banking. The, the biggest, biggest issues, even there's some school of thoughts saying that banks are gonna go away. There'll be 100% internet bank. Can someone name me, has, has there been any internet bank which has survived the before before the advent of this uh, fintech IoT kind of thing, none. There was only one in history, which is Egg Bank PLC. It is it's a UK-based bank. It only survived for just a while, and after that, it was it went dead. Actually, acquired by by Midlands Bank. Okay, why why didn't it fly? 
is because of back then, is internet mo mobility was not there. So basically, you need to get onto the wire. But with all this internet mo mobility that comes, all it takes is just bringing the thing to this thing, and it happens. So now with, with these things, it's real. It is real and it will go as per what uh, my colleague they just mentioned. This is real, so let's take it as, ba as, as bankers. Let's take this. I wish to share that uh, on Friday, I was over in, uh, there was a ceremony, the DFTZ, DFTZ uh, PM and Jack Ma launched the DFTZ, Digital Free Trade Zone. And then when, during the question and answer question, uh, session, Jack Ma told us about this. Says that number one, you need, okay, forget about outsmarting the computers. They are more intelligent than us. Hence AI, artificial intelligence. Okay, forget about being more hardworking than, than them, than computers. They don't take breaks. They don't, they don't get sleepy. Okay. But then he says that take the reality that this is coming. Everyone needs to embrace this. It's just that one thing that we have is actually which is not available with the computers, the technologies is actually, if you're familiar, okay, we have this term EQ, we have this IQ, right? One thing that, that is not available with computers, with technologies is about EQ, okay? So, and he threw in one very interesting thing. He called this, I think you can search the net or whatever. Now he called this LQ, which is actually love. So basically, business is about relationship, about human to human. There will be, there will be no such thing as humanless business, all right? So basically, yes, let's take this technology. As disruptive, uh, disruptive as it is, we use them, but we have EQ, we have LQ, and that will take the world forward. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Nasa. We, we certainly can't remove the human element, actually, in business. Um, Brother Fredos, I mean, as the, as the pure fintech play on the panel, um, perhaps we can ask you for your, for your insights. And, uh, thank you for sensing the, my um, nervousness, being seated to these uh, two um, uh, players who are already being uh, in the Islamic spearheading the uh, fintech play for a long time. So um, first, I'd like to correct um, our MC earlier. My name is Firuz, Firuz Muhammad Noor. Um, I'm representing uh, Sedania Innovitable Heart. Um, I'd like to split two sp uh, space, yeah? because earlier we were talking a lot more about disruptive fintech, which really changes the landscape of financial services as how we see it today. Um, but there's existing uh, space for complementary fintech, which is really looking at um, what Adi was saying earlier, where it's the use of technology on how you make, um, in a way, Sharia compliance a little bit more practical. So that's what we set out to do in the uh, earlier days. You know, we found this article that talks about commoditizing airtime in the Middle East where they use this commoditized airtime to, uh, to be a collateral to their financing. So we took this and we said, hey, this is a good concept. And of course, you know, being an aspiring, well, it was fintech player before fintech was even around, we went to the banks and we said, hey, look, uh, can we do something with this? But in the end, it's not enough to have that. We do need to understand the pain points of the banks. And way back then, the banks had a flaw full of people uh, basically subdividing contracts, making sure the documentations are there, and then they have a call center to actually call and uh, complete an ACAP process with each financing applicant, and then they need to make sure that everything is filed, and that was really taxing, and I don't think it's productive work really. So we set out with our partner bank, RGB Islamic, thank you very much, and we set out and said, this is something that we can improve with the use of technology. So, um, you know, um, some people say that Asidic is a trading platform. It is, but it's more than that. So we do take over the, um, the whole documentation bit, 
and we also add on the ACAD bit with the use of technology, um, messaging, app-based, uh, internet-based as well. So um, to us, that is a complementary fintech service that's there and is still around uh, for some foreseeable future. Um, I'll probably reserve my comment when it comes to disruptive fintech uh, in your following questions. Um, perhaps I can, thank you very much, uh, Bradley Fiddles. Um, perhaps I can um, re return back to um, young, young Mulia. Talking about pain, pain points with inside banks, um, in terms of um, distributive ledger technology uh, and obviously blockchain as a prime example of that. Um, perhaps you can share your thoughts as to you know, areas where you really need this, this particular technology um, I'm thinking of, you know, trade finance or, you know, KYC, et cetera, um, and even payment solutions. Perhaps you can highlight one or two examples of where, of where this is really needed, and particularly from, from uh, an Amundvest point of view. Um, the use of um, distributed ledger technology would really help us reduce manual work. Really, that's it. Um, although... You know, sometimes in, in our conversations with people, including regulators as well as practitioners, there's some misunderstanding on the concept of blockchain technology and, um, and its relationship to cryptocurrency. So I just want to kind of make that clear that cryptocurrency is not synonymous to blockchain technology. It just uses blockchain technology. But the use of blockchain technology doesn't mean that you're using cryptocurrency. So the use of distributed ledger technology, I think, will help us greatly in, in areas like um, trade finance and even bank guarantees. Um, I, I take something as simple as a, a, issuing a bank guarantee. You know, you actually go to and forth on a document. And then, you know, you might end up sending to the wrong uh, place or then there'll be changes onto the document. And by the time it reaches the beneficiary, it takes seven to ten days and it comes back. Um, all that, if we could do that really using DLT, and uh, I guess to a certain extent the whole concept of smart contracts using the DLT would facilitate this um, for something as simple as bank guarantee. We actually have a lot of people, hands and, and pairs of hands and, and eyes to do this. And um, so that's something, uh, so something like bank guarantee would be helpful. Trade would be even more helpful because at this point in time, when you talk about KYC and AML, the tracing and tracking of money is, is critical uh, to ensure that you know, there's no element of fraud. So, the, so if we were to use DLT, the, in, the destination and origin of money is traceable. So that will cut down, in my view, a lot of the current KYC and AML that we're currently doing right now. Um, and it will just facilitate uh, business uh, a lot quicker. Well, you can use DLT for anything, really. You could use it in the land office. You can do it anywhere, anything that requires you know, filing in, of huge documents, and especially when you need to start making changes on those documents. So um, there are amongst us that's actually trying to put this together um, between banks. And I know that some of us are trying bilaterally to work this out with our clients as well. And, and Presumably, that also extends into other areas like uh, SME financing, uh, financial inclusion, in terms of in terms of smart contracts. Well, um, smart contracts with uh, financial inclusion, not quite something that's high on my agenda. Um, I would say that to really push for financial inclusion and in SME micro SME financing is for us to move towards algorithm lending. Because a bank today will not, pay, will not spend time on a $10,000 lending. You know, I mean, you're going to have to do the same thing on the, uh, on the credit of a small guy and the credit of a big guy. And the credit of a small guy is very difficult to establish because, um, Dr. Adam, if you have a business and you don't give me accounts, and particularly now under the New Companies Act, you're not even obliged to file accounts, I would not know exactly how your numbers look like. But if one day our entire payment ecosystem is electronic, which means cash in by your customers is done electronically, and your cash out payments to your suppliers is done electronically, either via QR code or, or cash management solutions, 
The moment we can get full data of cash in and cash out electronically, then we can feed it to an algorithm uh, platform. That way, we would be able to then establish the credit worthiness of the small guys. So I'll be able to see how your money flows weekly. I'll be able to know exactly how much I can lend you, how much you're able to pay me back. That, to me, will facilitate SME lending. So in terms of smart contracts, you don't have to make a contract very complex, right? It can be very simple. So the concept of smart contracts, really, if you're talking, um, you know, not so much in the SME space. The SME space is how do we evaluate credit for on small on the small guys. This is outside the concept of musharaka, of course. But if you're just talking purely from a mudaraba, uh, uh, from from a a, a murabaha type of an approach, the use of algorithm financing, I believe, is the way forward for us to facilitate micro SMEs. Right, so, so still, the assumption is essentially debt-based uh, financing in that in that, in that, in that respect. Okay. I, I just, yeah. Yeah. Yes, Can I add on please, and please on do. on that? Okay. Uh, as they mentioned just now, okay, maybe she has the impression that perhaps the ten thousand uh, dollar financing, ringgit financing, is not too too small for her. No, not for us. Okay. <laughs> so basically, this is part of uh, financial inclusion. So what what it is is actually for DLT. No, talking about now, there has been issues all along about uh, SMEs getting financing. Okay, but I think DLT will solve the issue if somehow we're talking about now financing supply chain. Now we're talking about if there is within one, one supply chain whereby there is a major buyer which happens to be uh, banking with a bank and they have SMEs who are suppliers. But with DLT, if everything is basically transparent, if everything is digitized, the ledgers are all digitized, so basically, from the from the bank's point of view, okay, they are more able to be giving even the small financing for the suppliers who are actually uh, vendors for the big uh, uh, big customer of the bank. So, so, so here you have some connectivity with the banks and perhaps uh, you know, B two B platforms. Yes. Um, where where not just commercial banks, investment banks presumably too, mm -hmm. where where you can access clients and provide them cash flow financing. Yep. It needn't just be debt-based, but it can also be equity-based uh, cash flow financing. Yep. It's just that per perhaps this calls for a different kind of uh, way of assessing, uh, assessing and giving credit, if I may. Yes, yes. Okay? Well, yeah, sorry, it could be, be equity-based, it could be musharaka, but the, the reality on the ground is that if you are a really small trucker guy, right, I, and you don't have accounts to show me your cash in money. So what I've seen in the US is because they use, say, for PayPal or, or the cash in, we need to see the cash in flow, right? The cash in flow from directly from the client. So if you were to walk into a, 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 to a food truck and all clients say pay via electronically, so that's captured, that's data captured either to QR or, or whichever way that you want to use it, um, tapping on wallets. So that's data captured. And how he pays out is like what Adi said, you know, to his suppliers, uh, you, which it, then you will see the money going out. We need to have the full cash in, cash out for you to be able to build the cash flow. That actually becomes the proxy cash flow for you to decide as to, where, as to how the credit is worth. It could be structured as 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 equity or 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 murabaha, but the point here is that you need to capture data for it to be able for you to be able to then facilitate, um, you know, the financing. Yeah. I think what you're referring to is the the overall ecosystem needs to be available for the bank to properly assess, you know, that that type of financing, whatever the size. But I just, but I just wanted to get back to Dato, you, in terms of assessing, in terms of accessing, I would say. Um, just to give a sort of comparative analysis um, or discussion, um, the EU has already um, mandated from, I think, next year that um, through their uh, PSD2 um, uh, directive that all APIs in banks are to be, i.e. Mean, data is to be opened up to public APIs and, and not just uh, private APIs within, within the bank. Um, and the idea is presumably to uh, obviously, increase customers' um, 
and allow fintech companies to participate in banking services without having to um, obtain their own, their own license. In the current environment in Malaysia, some, some local banks, I think it would be fair to say, are experiencing declining deposits. Would it be an idea for regulators locally to consider similar such uh, regulation to mandate or open up um, uh, data, um, customer data from banks to third party fintech companies? Or is that just a little bit too early? That's a tough question. Well, I'll try to answer. We're, we're getting onto the hot topics. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this, because this, this has got to do with the regulation as well. But in so far as banks are concerned, I think not just the big banks, uh, the banks uh, which are part of a larger group, okay, is it, at our end as well, okay, this topic about API is something quite, quite dear to the digitization of the whole group that we're talking about. Uh, there has been, I think, when it comes to this issue, it's just about the way banks approach automa uh, automation back then. It's, it's, it's an issue about whether build or build or buy or rent, right? So there has been a lot of debates whether banks should be doing their own API or rather work with some other guys uh, that uh, partner with other banks, uh, work with other fintech companies or, or, or things of that sort. So basically, I would think that the jury is still out there. The people are still contemplating whether they do it on your own or partner with a lot of people. But somehow, I think Bank Nagara is, I've seen some writings and all that. They are encouraging that there should be participative collaboration between both parties, which I think is rather, personally, I, I would think that in so far as I'm concerned, I think banks would rather be banks. We are not into this kind of IT kind of thing. Because number one is because you know that the, the pace of IT is very, very swift. So one thing which is good today may be obsolete tomorrow. And I don't think that the kind of investment that needs needed gels down, well, gels very, very well with uh, the, the capital structure of banks. So I think it's still open, but it all depends on the banks and the, the way forward, the, the business, business strategic direction that they would, would like to take. And I, I'm going to ask a follow-up question now to Brother Feroz, because, again, not, not in the EU, but, but also in the UK, of course, they have even a, even a much more open banking policy. Um, and we've now seen the Bank of England relax licensing requirements and regulations in order to increase competition. Um, such now there are, are four digital banks um, operating out of the UK. They have no branches. They have very low operating costs. They have a higher capital reserve, 40%. Uh, any, any, any desire for Sedania to be a, a digital bank in the future? <laughs> You're putting me in a spot. Uh, I don't think we're there yet, really. Um, again, you know, when we're coming into a space where early on we come from a complementary uh, fintech space, um, the disruptive fintech space, although you know, we go to the Bank Negara sandbox, you go to SC's Affinity, uh, they're welcoming a lot more fintech players to come in and share ideas. You know, I, I do really see the way forward is, you know, having a re the real disruptive uh, element in fintech is really to have a digital bank. Mm. Uh, but do I see a challenger bank coming in and setting up from scratch, you know, with no, um, well, take aside the Alipay, the Google Pay and whatnot. Uh, but I see there's probably a better chance of success if the existing banks, if allowed by the regulators, you know, look into how do they change if the regulation allows them to go towards a, less, a lesser cost structure and deliver more value to the consumers uh, with the existing uh, brand that they have, the trust factor that they have, they have a better chance of success. And um, I think that will be a real disruptor when it comes to digital. And in the end, to put additional points towards you know, sharing of data across banks or a fintech player, it all boils down back to the, the user pain points, the consumer. What, what would they like? You know, yeah. um, earlier, the panel really shared this interesting fact about the millennials and how you know, yes. 
they don't know most of the bands. I think it's a very good point. I think yeah, Molly was exactly. talking about this before we came in this afternoon. You know, for, for all the, you know, they probably think that Touch and Go is a bank <laughs> because that's the most where they put their money to travel on, you know? Do you think the telcos might acquire a bank? Um, they'd no, like to try. They're too tackle. They've got to go and ask Bank of <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, speaking of a regulator, I mean, I think this is a very good point that you raised. I mean, regulators, yes, they regulate banks, but they're not going to regulate consumer behavior. I mean, they're not going to, they need to adapt. they're not going to tell my daughter or, or young William's daughter to, that they must open up a bank account. They're going to set up an e-wallet, more likely, you know. So they're not going to regulate um, a custom behavior, and, and, and they're not even going to try. But for sure, they're going to be very careful about our data inside your banks. Uh, that would be very critical, you know, for sure. You know. um, I just wanted to also, um, since, we, since uh, Emily, you mentioned uh, cryptocurrencies earlier, um, again, I just want to ask another hot topic question. Because, you know, uh, cryptocurrencies and, 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 and bitcoins, um, this definitely affects uh, monetary and financial stability. So as financial institutions, um, do you support these developments? Um, do you agree with them? Do you think, where, 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 where's your position on, on bitcoin, for example? Well, I think cryptocurrencies is just an alternative to the fiat currency. I think the whole drama that we have right now is largely because of the trading of those currencies. Um, and I know central banks, and, and actually I urge central banks to regulate this space as opposed to banning it. Don't ban it, regulate it, but what you really ought to prohibit is the trading of these uh, currencies. If they're just m meant to be means of exchanges, then it's fine. It's no different than real currency, you know, trading of currencies in, in Sharia. I mean, that, that whole concept of uh, speculation must be must be stopped um, again because more recently I, I actually a couple of years ago I bumped into a, a bunch of guys who are two Bangladeshis they set up this website allowing people to move um, to send money back to Bangladesh how they do that here is that they have about 1500 um, little shops Bangladeshi shops in in Klang Valley you want to send something to your mother, what you do is you buy airtime, you buy Bcash. So you buy Bcash here, and then your mother picks up her Bcash airtime uh, in Dhaka. Well, guess what? Bandagara doesn't regulate that, and nobody knows how much money goes in and out of, of, uh, of, um, of moving that, and it is cheap. There is no FX fluctuation. But more importantly, on the other end, so my question to them is, how's your mother going to end cash this Bcash? And, and the answer was, my mother doesn't need to end cash B cash because in Dakar I can use B cash to buy stuff. That in itself is a new form of currency. And then what I discovered was that there's a now there's this a billionaire in, in Dakar who set up a little exchange to manage B cash. So he actually now has a B cash exchange. So B cash is a little bit, I guess you could call like a cryptocurrency, well, an e currency. Um, and, and that has completely, um, um, you know, just gone under the radar and, and nobody's watching that. So, um, but to say you should stop that, you shouldn't because it's, it's, it's a great way of, of, you know, of helping people to, to move their money around, except that EML, KYC, nobody, nobody asks, sorry. And, and I guess remittances is, is actually a very big market, you know, um, a nine, Nine, a, nine, a nine billion dollar market in Southeast Asia, two million migrants, and, but only a third are using banks to, re, to remit um, f uh, funds back. Two thirds of it is going to non banks. Cryptocurrencies, gentlemen, uh, your, your, your views, your fatwa. <laughs> no fatwa, please. So we're expecting you know, a fatwa. Dr. Hassan is going to kill me if I make a fatwa or make a religious <laughs> position. Uh, but yeah, um, to me, there's no issue with cryptocurrency. Uh, again, it's the issue of the exchanges. Yeah? Um, you have um, local players coming out with their own e-currency, e-wallet, you know, that's another form of cryptocurrency. And you should not block that, you should not ban that, and it's okay. It's just when 
the cryptocurrency gets of certain size and then people start to create derivatives of it and then you know that's what's the future value of it you know and then somebody said okay my currency they're going to have a finite value to it and then people start you know speculating what the price could be and then it goes crazy whether it's sustainable or not i'm not sure but i'm sure for one thing whatever is sharia is meant to make sure that it's fair for everybody so if you do a non-sustainable modeling that is just time bound to, to break your you're bound to be unfair to somebody somebody who comes here towards the later end of the cycle will suffer and i don't think that's what sharia is all about you know, that reminds me, there was a very interesting article published in uh, IIBF's Journal of Islamic Finance. Uh, since it's published, I can, I can mention it, that it was authored by members of Bank Nagara's legal team. And they, and they were also, you know, trying to define a difference between e-money and, and digital currency. And, but they were worried about um, Bitcoin, because that, to quote them, uh, threatened the existence of a central bank. So I'm thinking of why, why the central, why the Chinese authorities closed down a Bitcoin exchange, why Jamie Dimon, the CEO of J.P. Morgan, uh, declared it as fraud. Um, but I think this speaks to, you know, these currencies need to be brought inside the system and not left outside of the system, because then we have some serious problems of KYC and. C C C C CTF and, and, and AMLA and all, and all the rest of it. Was it would that be a fair, a fair, fair comment? Regulation needs to be brought inside. And, and in fact, uh, same thing with Bank of England. They, they've, they've also, not just Bank of England, but I think um, uh, other central banks in, in India, they're also investigating official Bitcoins. So we might see in the future an official issuance of Bitcoin if it can retain its store of value um, and if it can help. Would that be fair? I mean, don't ban it, regulate it, but don't allow the trading of it. So anything that, you know, the, the trading of it is when crosses the, the line of permissibility in Sharia. Because you're putting a value which doesn't have any really underlying intrinsic value. So it becomes like trading of derivatives, that's my view, which is not allowed. Derivatives is allowed, but trading of derivatives is not. You know. I'm, I'm just reading one or two questions on, on, the, on, on the screen here earlier. Perhaps I can lob a few more interesting questions. Um, fintech and Sharia advisory, um, in terms of uh, product-orientated Sharia advisory today, is, it, is there enough flexibility for development um, in terms of... Well, it's certainly not incongruous. Mm. You know, I think it's, um, it goes hand in hand. Um, actually, like what Sidania had done, and, and also um, that's just putting technology and making um, the, the, the Islamic contracts um, easier to execute. So there's no, I mean, it's not incongruous at all. So the use of technology is just to facilitate trade. As long as we stick to trade, which is the basis of our Islamic economy and Islamic finance, we're good. So the, the the, the um, coming back to my conversation on, on micro SME financing, that is to facilitate trade, to facilitate funding the real economy. Anything that does that and using uh, underlying Sharia contracts is, is fine. So I, I, people always ask whether or not it's you know, in conflict with each other, whereas um, you know, we, the, the Muslim civilization, had been far more innovative than anybody 1,600 years ago. It's just then we kind of went to sleep for about 1,600 years, and then we kind of got up, and then everybody's saying, can we do this in Islam? Is this even allowed? I find that kind of perplexing as a question, since we were the most innovative kind before. Any, any other comments on that? Um, well, the principles are not uh, there to be banned. But um, I think that's where the Sharia advisors are there to allow some interpretations. Because yeah. we have a very fast-moving world. Exactly. And we have a very fast-moving exactly. IT world. Yeah. Um, so in, in our so we, can't, we can't be constrained that's right. by so. um, you know, a, a very product-orientated uh, environment, agreed, agreed. Which, which, which then perhaps, you know, uh, I think this is what the question is trying to allude at. Yeah, but what I'm trying to say is that you know, I've come across uh, a few occasions where the Sharia advisors do acknowledge that there was not a solution back then. 
and now there's developments that allow for this to take place. So there is a change in position, not a change in the principles behind it, yeah. but the change in the application or the 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 trans yeah. So, okay. Can I just say something? I think on that we had gone through that whole process where once upon a time people insisted that where Akkad had to be hand by hand or Akkad required a phone call and, and voice confirmation. We've kind of moved and progressed and say that it can that, that the Akkad can be done digitally. You know, so those are the evolution but that keeps within the context of what is permissible under Sharia. Uh, just to go back to your um, one of your interesting products, the uh, Tarawak trading platform, do you think there could be other other commodities, other other trading in terms of trading platforms that you could include, and and how does how do sort of external um, in terms of price discovery, how do external markets um, affect a local market? I mean, other than the CPO, but I mean, in terms of if you try to extend your trading platforms to other commodities, would it you're still able to get free and fair discovery? I mean, I'm thinking of you know Western trading platforms, how they short prices a lot, how they affect international uh, prices. I'm a bit biased here, you know, because <laughs> I am one of the alternative trading platform out there. Okay. Uh, we use telecommunication airtime yes. as an alternative as commodity. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it is noted that yeah, there are other, um, like for example, London Metal Exchange, and is out there. Um, and I'm very sure there are other forms of commodities that are just waiting to be found and uh, it's still subjected to our Sharia's interpretation. You know, we went through, when we first set out, there was no real um, writing about how do you identify that on a more academic. So we found these uh, IOFI standards. Mm. So they have a standard 30 from Bahrain and they said, okay, these are the 10 things that, you know, without going to a Sharia advisor, uh, a layman like me would be able to have a first opinion before you bring something to the Sharia advisors, right? Mm. So it does help us um, identify whether uh, a, a product is worthy of bringing to uh, the Sharia for, uh, to be an alternative a commodity in the future. Yeah? But to say um, something out there, um, to comment on an, a competing um, Trading platform out there, I think it's not my place, uh, Doctor. <laughs> okay. um, just one last question then from, from the screen. In terms of um, what, are the, what are the real threats to fintech and, and banking that you can think of off the top of your head um, in terms of the future development? Um, we've, we've, we've heard from you a few strengths and, 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 and weaknesses, but what about opportunities and threats? Um, I start first. Um, the real threat, in my view, would be inaction by the banks. That is our, just not doing anything would actually cause us to perish. Um, the opportunity is because in this country, uh, the banks are still being, uh, people still highly trust, uh, you know, that the banks are trusted, unlike in the West. So a five minute conversation with somebody in Greece or Cyprus. <laughs> They will be very direct with you. Yeah, they don't believe in the banks. Yeah. Um, but, and the, the opportunity for us is to understand, you see, as bankers, what we have done throughout these years was to create products. We create products and then we sell them. The difference in fintech is what they do is create experience. The design of any product is driven by customer experience. So CX is core in fintech's approach very different than the traditional banks. So that is something that we have to re-engineer ourselves. And I think if we can do that, we might be able to then uh, get onto, you know, get on the, the millennials and the younger generation onto our, our end. That's all. Uh, for me, actually, we can look, either look, look at it as a threat or opportunity, right? So basically, we're talking about not just the existence of banks, but actually the, the we're talking about jobs now. We're talking about jobs as bankers, right? Is so that under threat? Well, that's, <laughs> we, we can take that as a, as a real threat. But whether it's a threat or not, it all depends on how we look at things, how we adopt and adapt things. Especially, uh, just take about uh, this issue about how we assess credit. 
Okay? So basically, in the new ways of things, basically, if you have all the information, and when it, it, it's all transparent, it's all within a system that, that's basically trusted, okay? we can do, we can give our credit easily, not having this kind of risk framework, too much of risk framework, that is actually shackling ourselves. So now it's all about embracing the new way of doing things, approaching, being open to exploring new ways of delivering the customer experience, that's what they said. That's all. Basically, if, if we are slow, we are not receptive to things, actually we have no other people to blame than ourselves if we were to lose the job. Um, yeah, I'm not a banker. But I would say, yeah, the whole banking institution as a whole. Because you see, there's been disruption, although be it at a small, small scale. Um, so when SC launched ECF, there's one portion taken out. Yeah. When they do a peer-to-peer -peer crowdfunding, they take another portion out. If somebody were to come out later and say that, hey, can we do peer-to-peer -peer crowdfunding, but not for SMEs, but for individuals, there's another yeah. portion out. But a preemptive strike would be to look at how the banks can take up the space of digital banking, change the mm. landscape altogether with the blessings of the regulators, of course, mm. but the, uh, 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 um, a committed uh, decision to go and do a, di uh, a disruption all-encompassing rather than allow that uh, bit by bit, uh, you know, you know, it's very annoying when people start biting a bit, bit here, a bit there. You're not really sure where you want to defend. Yeah. But isn't it better that you, know, you go out there and you set something and say, look, you know that these are all the fronts that they're attacking mm -hmm. and we defend and we come out and create one whole answer. Yeah. That's better. Yeah. I think this is a very good point. If you stand still, you snooze, you lose. I think this is essentially... There's a Chinese saying, uh, yes. death by a thousand cuts. In terms of the banking model, or <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, this uh, the bits of business that's been chipped away yeah, so would eventually say, yeah. cause us, yeah. So when people think about um, a lot of banks, traditional banks, think that think of challenger banks being that disruptor. Actually, that's that's not really the that's not really the threat. It's not one huge challenger bank. It is the inability to evolve. That's our biggest challenge. And also the small little bits that's actually biting, yeah. nibbling. In, in terms of investment banking, I mean, um, I, I guess the same thing applies there rather than, than just wholesale banking. I mean, we've, we've heard a lot about crowdfunding at a retail level. What about crowd financing? Crowd financing um, and direct, uh, you know, in terms of IPOs, direct issuing direct issuer launches, or is that possible, do you think, in the future? I mean, I guess the precedent has been with Google and Facebook, with those, yeah. with those sort of direct auctions. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, the capital markets is a little different because yeah. when you talk about big numbers, then there is always an intermediary. You would tend to use uh, the investment bankers to, um, you know, trade sales are usually done closed door. But smaller IPOs can quite easily, like the leap market, can quite easily be done yeah. via your A platform. And you know, um, like the most recent, the first leap market IPO was raised only five million bucks. So, and um, you could quite easily do it over over the platform. So, there is some well, parts of the capital for these markets. Small transactions, then. Yeah, I think you there can. is there is opportunity for in, in the capital markets for crowd financing. Yes, yes, of course. So, so that that is possible for both the debt and equity side. But if you're talking about raising 20 billion ringgit, then you know I, I don't think so. People want to go down that route. So there is still investment bankers who still have jobs, um, <laughs> and um, but the smaller uh, capital markets uh, has never been the purview of the investment banks anyway. So. Okay, Alhamdulillah, I'm I'm, I'm getting signs from the back that uh, our our time is running out. So perhaps uh, thank you very much to our esteemed panelists for your. Thank time uh, with us and sharing your, your insights uh, this afternoon. And thank you also to the audience for your participation and your contributions. I see so many questions flicking up on the screen here. We actually could be talking all afternoon, I think. You know. Alhamdulillah. So thank you so much. Uh, perhaps I can go back to the...